All right. Uh, do you guys want to play a free one, or like, uh, uh, yeah. do you have another composition or something? Play a free one. Okay. Cat's got some stuff. Yeah, right. because we could play lining. I forgot about that one. You gotta have to practice a little bit. It's actually a little bit tricky. <laughs> surprise, surprise! Angela <laughs> McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 why I moved to New York. Yeah, I mean that's I'd rather not put that in. <laughs> <laughs> This is our friend, Angela Morris. Here she is emanating light from her instrument and just being rad. Yeah, our friends are cool. That's Angela in the middle there leading a group of kids in a parade who made their own instruments from scratch. And here she is leading the Weber Morris Big Band, a group of kids in adult bodies who play avant-garde music for big band orchestration. I'm not gonna try to describe the music, just check it out. To me, Angela is one of those musicians who just never accepted that everyone has to compromise their art in order to make things happen, which is one reason her music is so compelling. She's just the kind of hip, cutting edge, and courageous artist that I wish I could take to my younger self and say, see, you don't have to listen to anyone who thinks music is about shoulds and should nots. Be bold, like Angela. Angela runs a non-profit monthly concert series promoting Brooklyn diversity. She's way into activism, and I think she represents the very best of the Brooklyn scene, which is why we're excited to talk and play with her today on... So, uh, Angela Morris, welcome to the show. Hi. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. Uh, this is the fifth one that we've done, including the one we shot with us. Maybe. But we're not going to release them in order. You were one of the people at the top of our list to have uh, musically. I've been listening to music all week, and it's you know, I'm kind of like a stalker with this show. So, <laughs> um, When did you move to Brooklyn? You're from T Toronto, right? Yeah, I'm right? from Toronto. I moved here almost exactly 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years in a couple weeks. We moved the same year, huh? I think so. I thought you moved a year. No, I moved 2011. It's oh. 2021, Kat. Oh. My bad. We're watching the 2020 Olympics, but it's 2021. That's right. Yeah. Last year never happened. <laughs> no, but I actually, I wanted to ask you about last year, specifically last summer, um, is one of the main very intense things that was going on in the world was the protests surrounding the George Floyd murder. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about that because you had a, some sort of awakening, can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> Musical, jazz-related awakening. Uh, you were playing a lot of music in the protests, and I was wondering if you want to talk about that. Yeah, um, I mean, it was a really incredible experience. It was so great to be able to be with people again and make music with people again and... Um, just support a message that really needs to be heard, you know, Black Lives Matter, and bring attention to all the ways that systemic injustice is ruining our world mm -hmm. and people's lives and ending people's lives. Um, but as a jazz musician, I found it also, on a personal level, really meaningful because I had a chance to play a bunch of music that I had kind of had soured in my mind like particular pieces that just I associated with being in school and like negative experiences of being in school. You're talking about standards, I'm talking jazz. about jazz standards. Yeah, mainstream yeah, but some, jazz. Some particular ones, you know, right. where I just like never thought I would want to play those pieces again and then to have them recontextualized in those marches being led by black people in like a context talking about, I mean, much closer to where the music is coming from than like a white institution, you know? Right. Um, for me, that was personally liberating. And, you know, that's not what I was there for, but it happened and I am really grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we've talked before on this about uh, how it seems to be a little bit removed uh, jazz from from kind of the purpose I don't know if you could say the purpose of it, but when you think about Charlie Parker, uh, all these kind of people, you know, they were they were also underlying uh, uh, intentions. Like, you know, they were being told, well, you're intelligent, 
for a black person Mm -hmm. like it's almost like how people talk about dogs like of all the dogs this is a smart one but these people were geniuses so they had something to prove and i think that like maybe academic people who go into school who love music it's sincere and all of that they don't really understand that like playing fast playing virtuosic making all these changes and doing all this stuff maybe had something deeper under underneath it than that so if if you found something like that through the protests and you were playing music that people connected with i I don't know that's that's beautiful uh what what did it change for you do you want to play standards now? <laughs> I mean, I was, it m- made me practice them. Like, mm-hmm. I went home and I was like, dang, I don't actually know the bridge to caravan or whatever. And I want to be able to play bass notes in the next time I'm in the streets because I play tenor. And sometimes that was, you know, if there are no sousaphonists around, I'd have the low, the low end kind of covered. Um, so it just gave them a new meaning, a new personal I don't know, just it it attracted me to them again. And I think another thing about the way, I mean, we we could probably talk forever about the way institutions have uh, appropriated basically black music sure. and um, and here we all are as products of that, I yeah. think in one way or the other. Yeah. Um, but when I, w- I remember being in my undergrad and, and my teacher was like, oh, you should do a transcription. Like, what do you want to, what do you want to do next? And I was like, well, you know, I noticed that I'm listening to a lot of alto players for some reason, even though I'm a tenor player. And other than that, Wayne Shorter, like, you know, I'm thinking like Wayne Shorter, Eric Dolphy, Ornette Coleman, those were the people I was really listening to. And my teacher was like, "Eh, those are not really good choices for transcription. Yeah. Huh. Because they want me to learn jazz vocabulary. That's right. still that's we're just like getting worse and worse, basically. Right. But that's the attitude. It's like trying to canonize certain aspects that can be graded and like ranked and hierarchalized. You know, I'm just Absolutely. making up words here. It's well put. Um, so it's so far removed from the the political, radical, spiritual, human, like all the reasons why people were making the music they were making that I was attracted to in especially like free jazz um, players. So it's interesting to look back on that now. And I mean, Ornette Coleman, jazz vocabulary? Are you right. kidding me? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, for real. That's, it's just like 100% jazz vocabulary. Absolutely. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, that's, I don't know. It's just, I feel like it's like ultimately racism. Yeah. It's just like another manifestation of, of... Well, it's easier to teach. It's it's really hard to teach art and improvisational art. Yeah. It's incredibly difficult to think about teaching it. So if you just yeah. box it into a thing of like, well, I teach my students the first year, they should learn these 20 licks and practice these 10 songs mm-hmm. and learn putting those licks yeah. in. It's almost like a method that kind of ignores the history of jazz which was a history of innovation you know it was very radical what these people were doing so yeah Yeah, even like writing out a transcription it could be really difficult i was just thinking i had a student who had to learn a duke ellington solo for an an audition for a jazz band and i had to help him learn the solo and the way it was written it's like that's not how duke is playing it this is how Duke is playing it. Like, listen to this. And then we tried to just mimic how Duke played it, and it was nothing like what you see on the page. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to even imagine that you could write some, like, drum, yeah. drum uh, grooves down. You could maybe dictate the, notate the, the rhythms, but that's not it. That's, it certainly comes after yeah. the fact. I always tell my students when we read um, uh, syncop- syncopated music, like Chameleon or something, you know, I'm like, it looks really hard, but if you listen <laughs> yeah. to it, you'll sing it, and it's, it sounds better. So even that, to think about uh, notating music, it has to go through the Western uh, uh, sort of pipeline in order to get to a student in college or yeah. high school, you know. Here's a kind of a strange question. If you, if you could give, you know, you know, in Harry Potter where they hold the wand and they pull like a memory out and put it in somebody else. If you could do that, no, you know, not Harry Potter. I, I know I read them all, but uh, well, they do that with the memories. They pull the the memory out and they put it in a vial. I never read them. Hmm. And then he sticks his head in the water and he can see. Oh, the, the water thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was going to ask you. This is something I've been waiting to ask. A, <laughs> in Dumbledore's office, they have the, exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you could give <laughs> one thing out of your mind as a person who is 
interested in contemporary music, new music, avant-garde art, all of this, to a person who loves music and goes to gets on Ticketmaster and goes to see Paul Simon or whatever, but has never dabbed their feet in the water of like new music, things that are creative, things that are not in the mainstream. What what would you give to them? Just it's a vague question. The love of it. I mean, the I sound. think there are creative things in the mainstream as uh, well. Absolutely, like, but I'm talking a... about the typical like you know golfer dad yeah, yeah, who just guess. likes you know Bruce Springsteen and Paul Simon and da 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 or whatever. It could oh, be I a love person. Paul Simon. It could be a person who has a thousand hip hop records, but they've never listened to like something like their, your big band. Their, yeah. Okay. Okay. Their first chance. Their first endeavor. So wait, I'm taking a thought. Out of, I'm giving Anything, them one of feeling, my memories. Uh, an appreciation, not a memory, but just an appreciation a thought, a feeling, anything that you would gift to the world of people who don't quite know how rad this music can be? I would say um, allow yourself to have this experience for X number of minutes. Like if the piece is seven minutes long, just allow yourself to have this experience for seven minutes. It might make you mad. It might make you uh, anxious. It might make you confused, or it might make you excited. It might make you curious. Like whatever is coming up, just let that come up and ride it for the the length of time that the piece lasts for. Yeah, I hope it happens. I hope hope we develop this technology <laughs> in the future.
Any ideas? If you could do something to make the scene better, it's a great scene, but if you could make it better in any way, any ideas what you might do? Ooh, uh, she's making it better with Brackish. We didn't talk, didn't talk about that. But. Yeah, what is Brackish? Oh yeah, Brackish is, uh, well, it's a concert series. It used to be a monthly, once a month concert series. Right now it's a whenever we do it concert series. Um, last year we did four outdoor shows and then an online streaming fest, or not streaming, but like people made videos and we recorded the live during, concerts. You're talking about during the pandemic. During the pandemic, yeah. yeah and we, so that's online. You can watch it. The two-day Brackish Music and Art video spectacular. Great. It's online. Um, and it's like a woman and queer, non-white guy focused basically series. Um, just as a counterbalance to the way it seemed, especially the experimental avant improvised Brooklyn pocket of shows seemed to be pretty rare that I was you know I'd be one of the only women there and um, it's a very white scene overall so I had the opportunity to start a concert series and I thought okay I'm gonna be intentional about this who's gonna play and try to bring people together not only from those different um, groups, but also visual artists, poets, dancers. Like, I felt the desire to connect with people who are making experimental work in other disciplines, and I just didn't really see that happening. So, I was right. trying to bring those people together. And it's been five years now. And where can people find this? Where can they find uh, they have a it's, website? Yeah, or a... it's Brackish Brooklyn on Instagram. Um, and there's a Tumblr, <laughs> brackishbrooklyn.tumblr.com. Yeah. It sounds beautiful and, and really exciting. And, um, you know, I, it seems like there's less multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary stuff than I would have thought in this kind of creative scene around here to, yeah. to begin with. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is tough. I mean, different disciplines have different needs as well, like practically in terms of putting on shows. But last year doing things outdoors was actually turned and in different neighborhoods turned out to open some doors um, that made some really cool stuff happen. Great. So you're the first saxophonist we've had on the show, and um, I wanted to ask about the saxophone as a saxophonist. So you're obviously not, going back to what you were saying, you're not a Coltrane clone or a, even a John Zorn clone or any of that. You have your own sound and your own approach to it. Uh, what, what is the saxophone to you? Is it like an extension of all these flutes that we found in archaeological digs? Is it... <laughs> Um, is it a brass instrument? Is it like a cl uh, fancy clarinet? Is it more like the human voice or something completely <laughs> different? And you, you started playing violin, right? Does that, does that factor into it at all? Like, what, is, what do you see the saxophone as? Yeah, I mean, saxophone is really cool. I love breathing Agree. to play. I think that's a really obvious yet overlooked aspect in certain ways, just yeah. like... If I feel like I should really meditate or something, if I practice, I'm like, oh yeah, this literally, the reason I feel better right now is because I'm literally doing breathing exercises. Wow. Like this is, uh, and they've studied it with singing, like our vagus nerve response and singing, the vibration like alters our uh, gut brain mood So saxophone reaction, is for better I'm people. Pretty sure is that what you're saying? <laughs> saxophone does the same thing. Yeah, I think it, uh, We're basically it Zen monks. Me. That's what you're saying. Like, when I, uh, you know, when I approach it, it helps me in that way. It definitely helps me. Um, I think it's the most versatile of all of the instruments. Do you agree with that? Uh, no. Besides MIDI, <laughs> no, besides synthesized and MIDI, I think I it is. Like, it is an awesome instrument, and um, especially as I get into extended techniques and like develop whole sound expressions through that and bringing violin into that it's become interesting to me if I improvise and I have both instruments available sometimes I feel like it doesn't matter to me which instrument I choose because this type of sound that I'm thinking of in my head I could get from either instrument cool. Interesting. Um, but you know saxophone's loud and you can play it in the rain those are those are good things about it that violin doesn't have going for it you like, can play in the rain well you know like if you're in a protest that starts yeah. raining it's mm. not the end of the world you're i wouldn't bring my violin i mean 
Do sure. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You guess but, you can't bring a piano outside. But you can get a lot yeah. more timbres and, and, and tonal qualities than, say, the clarinet or the flute. What? No. Wow, we're doublers. Totally. We're not allowed to do... Absolutely. <laughs> we're not allowed to make those decisions. I mean, look at the difference between, like, <laughs> David Sanborn and Wayne Shorter and... A classical like yeah, but somebody they're not like impr- you gotta Lofner you or, no, or, but you, you know. gotta look at some new music people that are doing really freaky shit. Like you gotta look at they are, but I could add saxophones to that. I could say like they're even broadening that instrument right. even more. You're you know, a, like a trombone. S- like hmm. he loves the saxophone. Yeah, you love the saxophone. <laughs> I just think it has so many possibilities that other instruments, you know, and even without slapping a metal mouthpiece on and having like a really bright sound. Like, you can change the quality yeah. of it so easily, you know, with anything. It is. It is. Like, I'm biased. I'll admit yeah. I have some bias. It is a for very sure. cool invention. Yes. So and you, I do thank prefer you, it to the clarinet. There, yeah, there you go. That's all I'm trying to get here. Uh, so you are actually <laughs> married to a saxophonist. That's true. And yes. I wanted to ask about that. Like, I can't imagine as a saxophonist being married to a saxophonist. What's that like? Just normal? Am I wrong that there's a. I mean, I'm married to a person who plays saxophone, like, (laughs) so, (laughs) that the person is the more important aspect of that equation. Sure. Um, I think if I was married to, like, a weird competitive saxophonist, then, yeah, that could, that could cause some problems, but. (laughs) But you hear each other practice, obviously, you both complain about reads, I mean, I complain about reads, like, daily, I have nightmares (laughs) about reads, so, I mean, it, it has to be, like, a commonality that, like, say, somebody who's married to a banker doesn't Can you have... separate work from life? Is that yeah, what you're asking? That's a great... Yes. That's a much better I mean, question. Okay. In During the pandemic, when we weren't going to the practice studio for various reasons, and we were both trying to practice at home, and neither of us had anywhere to go, I found that difficult. Like, the hearing the saxophone practice, doesn't matter who's doing it, it just, like... F- and feeling all the things that were going on about what does it mean to be a musician during this pandemic? Uh, will I ever play with people again? Why? Why? Etc. You know, then I sometimes found his unwavering discipline in practicing the things he was practicing to be like difficult for me to hear because it was so loud in our apartment. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't think that's. I don't know. I think that has more to do with like the overall scenario of the yeah. world than it did being married to a musician sure yeah sure maybe um because i could have had a, if i had had if he was my roommate i would have lost my mind you know what i mean like because i love him and i know what he's doing is making him happy <laughs> and and well and everything you know then then it has at least that positive connotation going for it when i will say when i had a roommate who's a saxophonist when i first moved to new york and that was activating a lot of my like practice room insecurity feelings when i wanted to practice at home yeah. so i do think like depending on where i'm at in my own uh mental state it can be it can have its challenges but for sure um but yeah that's more like living with other musicians just period i would say yeah yeah it's not always easy sometimes it's great yeah and then it's also great i mean it's great because it's just normal and we understand everything about why we're doing the things we're doing like neither of us have to explain to each other like why all these weird expensive things we do <laughs> are important. <laughs> do you, you guys know? geek out on stuff together? Are you like, check this out? Have you heard this this bootleg recording of like Sonny Rollins in 1960? I, I mean, is it I just like a separate thing? Too. Right. To us, it's right. like, oh, wow. I don't know. I guess like sometimes, but also I think neither of us have that tendency as a prominent sure. thing in our personalities anyway. Right. So it's more just like we're working on stuff we're checking stuff out and also we were on tour together like we were on tour together for like more than half of the days of 2019 and then we moved and we moved into together for the first time got married and moved in together we didn't live together before and then there was in the same year mm -hmm. and then there was a pandemic so um we really didn't live together until the pandemic happened so that also was an an interesting twist that a very interesting twist and we are still happily married yeah (laughs) that's it is the test right the pandemic it's like are we really doing this or not like how are we going to live together just with nothing else because i mean being on tour together is that it's kind of similar there is a similar quality to being quarantined you yeah know? you like shared a hotel room 
Hmm. Yeah, because yeah. we we just like were together twenty four seven every day right. before. But it's different because you're like going different places every day and seeing people and doing something that makes people happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Watching them be happy about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell us about the big band project you have? It's pretty interesting to me. It's uh, with Anna Weber. Yeah, the Weber Morris big band. Yeah, um, and I, I hate to ask people. What's your music like? But if you were gonna describe it for anybody who's watching, could you describe it in any way? Um, it's a more or less traditional big band instrumentation. So we have five woodwinds, four trombones, four trumpets, piano, guitar, bass, drums, and vibraphone. Uh, and sometimes it sounds the way you might expect that instrumentation to sound, but a lot of times it sounds more like a new music ensemble or a bunch of improvisers or spaceships. I don't know. Like, (laughs) it's uh, an instrument. It's like my symphony, you know, Hmm. of improvisers. And I was interested in writing for big band because it is like the large ensemble. It's like the large compositional vehicle for writing for improvisers. And of course, you can make your custom ensemble if you want to have strings in your ensemble or a harpist or whatever but in terms of the practical ass i mean if you can call a big band practical it's not very practical but in terms of that i can't imagine yeah yeah. p other people in the world have now played some of my big band pieces and that's happened because there are big bands in the world right right? so that already exists so that's partly why that limitation was interesting to me were you thinking about with the two of you thinking about kind of a traditional meets something never done before kind of thing old and new put together was it anything like that or was it just you like the sounds and the the orchestration of it yeah i think well for myself just writing my own music but for that instrumentation that's what it was about and i think anna would say the same thing that it wasn't for the the big band in and of itself wasn't the main attraction Mm. it's mostly just like getting to write our music and orchestrate it for a large group of people and uh and get it played.
So we have this special segment that we do every time, we try to do every time, it's not required, but it's uh, uh, Wish I'd Known Then, which is something that maybe if you could go back in time and tell yourself or somebody like you that wants to do what you do, uh, something that you learned along the way that you wish you had known earlier. It could be about practicing or the business or dealing with musicians or any kind of thing. Uh, overall general one, that it's good to ask questions you don't know the answer to already. Mm. That's as, a good one. Yeah, as Don't a assume. Uh, perfectionist <laughs> in recovery, mm. which is I, why I would say... Oh, I'm going to steal I, that phrase. That's uh, really great. That's actually why I think I was attracted. I mean, I was not attracted. Why improvisation claimed me as its own is is as part of my recovery as a perfectionist. Mm, I love it. Um, but, you know, school, being in school, it's a lot of li our lives has was was that yeah. and uh, I was like that kid that would ask questions because I could tell someone else in the class didn't understand what the te I thought the teacher did a bad job of explaining it so I'd ask questions so that the teacher would say the thing again because I could tell that my friend was confused that's very empathic uh, that's great empathic but also would I ever ask a question I mean like in the not school or in school you know like it's not like I knew everything forever but I should somehow sort of thought I did but like you know with friends people would be like oh did you check out such and such Blah blah blah, and I didn't want to be like I don't know what that band. I've never heard of that band or whatever. I wanted to fit in, so mm -hmm. I would just like play along. And this, well, I think now we have Google. You could play along and then like Google it later and, sure. and, and still check it out. <laughs> sure. But you miss out on uh, learning why the person you're with yeah. cares about that and mm -hmm. what's exciting about it to them, what it means to them, and. I mean, obviously, I know now that it's really interesting to ask questions, and it's also... I have 30 that we won't get to for you, <laughs> so, you know, like, you're, I'm, I'm on your side about this, yeah. Yeah, and also, um, people love to talk about the things they know and like and are excited, but it's like asking some, a New Yorker for directions. Oh, like, yes. It's exactly the same. You you get to, <laughs> you get to like, prove... Please let me help you. Yeah, you get to prove that, yeah, you know your way around. <laughs> And then, like, share that with somebody in a nice way. So, yeah. Um, so, where are you from? Yeah. Question, <laughs> questions are good. Yeah. Yeah. Through the millennia, the role of a musician has changed dramatically. Like, we talked on one of these about how there wasn't even a profession of a musician. Like, you'd be a yam farmer, but you'd play, you'd be like the chief of the music ensemble at night. Uh, but it's not your job, it was your, it was your role. And it's just changed and it's kept changing. You think about Bach, you think about uh, uh, Ornette Coleman. Uh, I know this is an impossible question to answer, but since we're all creative people, like, what would you see 
a future role of a musician even looking like? Or if you could maybe make it something, if it was the best case scenario, but where, where do you think this might be going? Like, we're just at the tip of the information age. We've really just entered this chapter. Like, any ideas on where this might go, how musicians might be, uh, their role in society might be in the future? I think musicians' role in society now, whether it's on purpose or not, is helping people be human with themselves and others, you know? And I think non-musicians through the pandemic have said how much they depended on music, recorded music, obviously, to survive. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And we depend on it to survive even when there isn't a pandemic, but I think the awareness of that is pretty low level. Uh, most people would not count it among the yeah, vit- necessary... You need vitamin A, you need vitamin yeah. B12. But <laughs> obviously, if every culture has had it, we need it. It's yeah. fulfilling yeah. some yeah. kind of need. need. To yeah. Feel the feels. All of them. But, you know, Bach wrote through the church, and Mozart wrote through the the king and and, and right. bird played in clubs and all of this it just I, I wonder sometimes and I have no idea I don't even know how to be a musician in this society right now the one that I live in mm-hmm. I just wonder where it's gonna go you know as things you know VR as people are walking down the street with VR headsets on and they can see your profile when they walk past you you know like what what we will what will be our outlet for all of this it's complicated yeah I mean I I I have been thinking about how technology like the way humans are creating an entire existence in technology for ourselves like an entire ecosystem of vr reality i mean even though we're not quite at that level for everybody yet we're we're all spending like huge chunks of our time and attention on our phones on our computers like in these head spaces that we th- that somebody, some human, designed. Right. I don't know. I feel like I'm going off on a tangent, but like... Oh, it's fine. Uh, it's good. Why do we think we can do that? Yeah. <laughs> why, why? I don't it's know. It's addictive. Like, well, there's been a lot of talk about dopamine and how these yeah. companies know how to spike your dopamine. So it's basically even chemical addiction. Oh, yeah. Point. I mean, I, it's, there's definitely like the evil empire side of it is very mm-hmm. strong. And I think maybe part of what musicians are doing is not that you know just doing something devoting yourself to something that's not that is a resistance against that yeah actually like several maybe it was like a year ago but i had um i guess i'll I'll just say who it was i'm sure she doesn't mind to talk about her but my mother-in-law jesse's mom came over to help with naomi and all this and we were just talking about music she's an opera singer didn't know that cantor she's she's yeah um, and I was telling her how much I liked this over part mass. And I was like, oh, what the hell is just listen to it? That's like where you have any, where, anywhere to go. So we listened to the whole thing, I don't know, 40 minutes or something. And she said, I haven't listened to a full 40 minute piece of music in years. And this was a very special gift that you just gave me. Oh, so wow. it's like, she people is need that. So such a lovely person, by the way. I was, yes. here, I was here once with her and she's so fun uh, to talk to. She's yeah. just a lot of life yeah yeah it's vulnerable to Mm -hmm. sit down i mean during the pandemic i there were days where music like got me through it there were days where it was like "Mm, too it's too much it's too it's too piercing to like listen to something real i'm just gonna put on bruce springsteen or something yeah (laughs) your secret love (laughs) i mean it it was the first concert i ever went to and i picked the saxophone i remember thinking when the band lady was like we have this we have this (laughs) instrument she got to the saxophone and i was like you can play a lot of different kinds of music Uh with that which is weird because that's what i do i play in r&b clubs and avant and jazz gigs and all this it's just really strange to think about that um that is partly why I wanted to play saxophone too. Was that like I at the time felt that violin was limited to certain kinds of music. I don't necessarily because the saxophone's so versatile. I didn't you can do think so I, much with I don't it. actually yeah. think that's true anymore. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> damn it. Uh. <laughs>
So this is called uh, This Really Happened. It's our segment about stories from the musician life. What really happened? Tell us what happened. Um, I think the craziest gig I've ever done was outside of Vegas in the desert. They built a huge clear acrylic dome just for this one gig. We were accompanying dancers who were dancing in silver bodysuits on mirrored plinths amongst gray rocks and really huge silver cacti. And I was wearing clothing by a luxury designer whose name I am not allowed to mention. And Thank you. Um, <laughs> I didn't get to keep 